Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. Oh, this? Oh, what's this? It's a new tattoo. It's a new tattoo. It's a new tattoo. It's a new tattoo. Yep, it's a new tattoo. It's a new tattoo. And I don't hate it. And I actually don't hate it this time. In fact, I like it. I could be in the honeymoon phase, but it's a new tattoo. Yes, I moved myself closer to the camera for to show off my new tat tattoo. Oh, best tattoo experience I've ever had. So this podcast is brought to you by Awaken Tattoo and Gallery in Chicago, Illinois, just off of Chicago Avenue in Humboldt Park. Joseph did the work and it was the most beautiful shop I've ever been in. Um, I mean, definitely clean, but the, the aesthetics were super beautiful. And then he, he's just a good guy, super He's good. He's talented as, as heck. I can't believe how clean these lines are. Um, and it could be because this spot isn't that painful. But I swear he had a, a soft touch. It was like a gentle tattoo. I don't think I ever passed like three on the pain scale. Not even close. I might not even pass two. And I could have, you know, it's, it's, I could be just getting used to tattoos or my pain threshold could be just getting higher. Um, but he just did such a good job. Didn't over, t- like, is me and him in the shop. And uh, we talked a bunch beforehand, but when it was time to work, we just got to work. I was just meditating you know, picturing, picturing the Jaguar pretty much in my head, um, trying to embody that in my, uh, you know, belly, power, heart, etc. And um, I think it took f- three or four hours, but this is a piece of cake. It's like an enjoyable experience through and through. And uh, I have uh, 11 tattoos now. And um I've liked two of them after getting them. Um, And this is the third one I like after getting it. He did such a good job. Such a good experience. Awakened tattoo and gallery. So why? You know, why do I have to go and get a Jaguar tattoo? And, uh, you know, I already, so one, I already committed to the tattoo game quite a bit. I, like I said, this is my 11th tattoo, and um, uh, so that's part of the reason why. Um, next reason is Jaguar energy or medicine. So during my Jesus roost, okay. Jaguars have visited me in um, in the psychedelic state, pretty much. Now. My journey with ayahuasca started in Peru, the Peruvian Amazon, and based on tradition of Peru, um, they acknowledge a a trinity of totems, uh, the anaconda or serpent, uh, the jaguar, and the hummingbird um, was the lineage that I was told. So yes, I could have been programmed, Um. But I actually didn't meet the jaguar in the jungle, in that era, in those jungle sessions. In my later sessions, um, he or she, it, my mind, imagination, has painted this jaguar, and it has come with a certain amount of wisdom, a certain amount of grounding, presence, um, stepping into kind of like showing me what it means to be sovereign, sovereign individual. Uh, grounded, like I said, um, and fully present. And 
either my imagination has really taken a liking to this totem or there are things that I don't understand and entities visiting me that are beyond my scope of me, um, some combination of the two, I'm unsure. But the impact of those journeys has been enough for me to really uh, dive into the Jaguar totem. Um, I use the imagery all the time, so it's cool to me. If you don't have a tattoo and you're thinking of getting one, don't do it. Your skin is beautiful. Don't don't mess with it. It's already so beautiful, your skin. Why would you want to... You wouldn't put a bumper sticker on a Volvo. Your body's a temple. And, and temples never have artwork in them. There's no paintings, frescoes in, in the Vatican except for the entire walls are covered with paintings. So why would you put it a tattoo on your body? But really don't do it. Your skin is beautiful. Listen to your the wisdom of your mother and your father. Um, um, and don't do it. It can be painful. It's it's painful, you know, especially some places. Like I got I got some I got some uh, side body action. That was very painful. The back is also very painful. Um, so don't like, why, why would you subject yourself to, to that pain? Uh, you're, you're already so beautiful as you are. So don't do it, but I did it. And I actually like this one. And thank you so much, Joseph. You are an artist and a scholar and a friend. Um, pricing was just like, so, so reasonable for the, uh, outcome and I am thankful despite my uh, overjoyous uh, attitude right now. Very much thankful for the experience. And uh, heck yeah, looking forward to carrying this totem with me. And of course, I'm planning more tattoos now. And because uh, when you have a good tattoo experience and you see the rest of the body of uh, as a canvas, um, it seems pretty tempting. And I, and I already know what I'm, I think I know what I'm going to do. So I'm basically looking at my arm as some sort of animal totem pole, not to um, appropriate too much, but I like animals. I like uh, relating them to certain significances and creating some sort of reason or uh, essence or feeling behind their presence. Um, so I, I kind of just want to continue to represent the animals that uh, have visited me over and over either in my mind or in present reality. And really, there's so many. But, um, I got I got a bunch of arm space here left. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go hummingbird here. An American buffalo at the top. The horns. Full bison head. Maybe up here. Like a shoulder plate. Um, I was thinking praying mantis somewhere here. Maybe a scale praying mantis. Spider? I don't know how much I want to carry around the spider totem. There already seem to be present. And uh, I love Spider-Man. Um, so maybe a spider biting me where Spider-Man got bit. Um, and, and then an owl appeals to me. Owl, but just the you know hummingbird, American buffalo, which coincides well with my overarching mission, which I haven't talked about since episode one. Um, but it's becoming more and more crystallized what uh, like a, a soul's purpose or a soul's mission or just like a altruistic mission um, that I want to accomplish while I'm here and. I've simplified it to a very short sentence, and that is bring the American buffalo back to the Great Plains. Increase, bring back the American buffalo population to the Great Plains. Why? Because monocrop culture, growing, overgrowing corn and soy, has degraded, degraded the soil to the point 
where some of it, some soil can't, per, can't even grow plants. The Great Plains was, con, was considered the most nutritious soil on the entire planet. And there are patches of it that are, uh, have been, we've taken all we could. And part of that is the extermination of the buffalo population because ruminants, cows, uh, bison, cattle, uh, eating the grass, shitting back on the earth replenishes the soil. That shit is so necessary. Even them stomping the soil down, packing the soil, eating the grass, pooping it out, moving on, the soil replenishes itself. So this, the, the phase that will look something like acquire land somehow or subsidize land through the government by creating a really solid uh, pitch uh, with petitions, um, remediating that land uh, into grassland. And that's not that challenging. The government is already subsidizing the land that has been completely decimated and that can't grow crops. Um, they're paying farmers to not grow on that land because they can't. So they're subsidizing farmers already. So, so taking that land and rehabbing it, um, it's not, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of acres that need to be re remediated. So in terms, I know bison need a lot of space, um, but the space is available. Um, the land is already being subsidized. So to take that land um, and allow it, I think the upfront work, turning it back into grasslands, part of it's going to be tilling what, what was there and bringing in native species of grasses and letting them do their thing. Grasses will grow. Um, the land will regenerate. It might, that might take three to five years, maybe faster. There, there's, there's technology that I'll definitely have to look into while, while crafting this business plan um, or this purpose plan. So remediating the land and then bringing bison, bringing buffalo back to that land and allowing them to live, allowing them to roam, maybe, um, you know, minimal fencing structure. I'm, I'm thinking we need to link together tens of thousands of, pe of acres in a row for these bison to move across, for them to flourish and them to grow, to replenish the soil, which is going to bring back insects, which is going to bring back birds. The bison are going to bring back uh, wolves and um, other predators in a way which we can continue to manage as we see fit. And then, uh, and furthermore, creating a healthy and nutritious food supply for humans as well. The buffalo served the people of these lands for hundreds of years, if not more. And uh, we can do that again. So bringing nutritious food, real nutritious food, red meat, uh, bison meat. Um, if you have any questions about the nutrition of meat, Paul Saladino, he has multiple podcasts. He, did, he was on Rogan. He was on Aubrey Marcus's. He was on, he has his own. There's no doubt there's nutrition in red meat and in animal foods. I'm not going to argue that because I don't actually have the linguistic artillery to back it up as well as he does. Um, but I do know that us feeding off of that, off the bison as well, will actually uh contribute to the cycle of regrowth and health of the bison nation too, of the buffalo population as well. So that's my goal. And what that means is by regenerating the land, we're actually going to contribute to water health, which is going to contribute back to land health, the cycle of life as Lion King put it, the cycle of life as Lion King put it, the cycle of life as Lion King put it. And so that's my goal. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. And it actually feels good enough to like, Okay, I'm going to give myself to that. Um, and it starts by building this plan out. I think it starts a little bit by talking about it. Maybe, you know, you talk about goals. At times it can defeat it 
especially if people um, congratulate you before you actually accomplish the goal. Um, if uh, s- someone looking for validation only, that might be a, a cease to the goal. Uh, I think I can persevere through that. If you wanted to share positive words of affirmation about the goal, great. If you wanted to contribute energetically, better. If you wanted to contribute operationally, financially, um, legally, that's best. Uh, financially, not yet. I have to create the business plan and figure out the best way to where funds can go directly. Do they have to go to the land? Um, first and foremost, is there a way to subsidize that? Um, does it have to be privatized land? Uh, does the government want to get involved? Uh, these are, if, if there's ways you can contribute, if there's ways, people that you know in your network that can assist me so that I can put my energy, I'm a young gung ho, um, uh, you know, this is a person for this willing to be used my time and energy be used for creating this uh this mission which is to bring the american buffalo back to the great plains but but cool so this came up recently i had two messages um actually one was a conversation and uh, and and they're they're actually linked together, and it's about laughing during sex. What's up with that? And then someone asked me, they're like, "Why won't my boyfriend cuddle with me after sex?" And this is my hot take. This is a hot take. And um, let me know what you think. I was raised on porn. Go back to the porn episode. Porn was my primary sexual educator. Catholic school growing up, not having the confidence to take chances to initiate sexual acts uh, through high school when I was raging um, on the inside. And uh, having to learn pretty much through trial by error uh, in college. Um, Still learning so much, but now uh, enjoying sex way more than ever before and the reason is is because there is a goal of performance associated with sexuality and this is for for the men particularly for the males but understand this as a woman especially if you are heterosexual and you participate in sex with men the performance um aim goal of sex is bound to a bunch of different shame. I'm not saying you don't want to try. As a man, we do have to work on uh, sexual practices. You know, like for me, again, um, like coming fast or, you know, um, was was a thing. And because it, it would be like in seconds, I would be able to come and a little bit of performance anxiety, focusing on performing, like focusing on retaining, um, ultimately contributed uh, to better sex practices. But there was a bunch of shame bound up into that performance anxiety, which I don't think contributed. I think I could have gotten to the place of enjoyment of sex much sooner than, um, than I did. Porn, uh, to not make it the whipping boy, it's not the problem uh, with with sexuality. You can argue that the market shaped porn just as much as porn shaped um, society. Um, So I thought while watching porn that I wasn't having a proper sexual experience unless the, the woman was moaning a particular way or basically in rapture the whole time. I had this expectation that if a woman wasn't like dumbfounded with rapture, that I wasn't adequate or I wasn't doing a good job sexually. 
So what this meant is any laughing during sex would be a huge trigger because that would show, you know, that would mean that they're not in rapture, they're not moaning, they're not, uh, they're not fully feeling it, and the laughter would feel like they're laughing at me and would trigger a, sh- a shame response. Of course, you can be with a partner who can reassure you, can have a clear conversation um, that that may not be the case, that you don't have to perform every time in any particular way. But there were some one night stands, if you will, or some single sexual experiences where I would be rushing uh, to the finish line. I'd get to the finish line fast. And then there was an awkwardness where I did feel like I let the person down. And I probably did. Um but th- that rushing, that performance anxiety actually made me worse off anyway. And and by picking and choosing a sexual partner a little bit more carefully, someone that you can actually have a intellectual co- like connection with or someone that you can just trust through conversation, um, they might be able to ease your mind. Or at least if it's like a one night stand, like maybe... You can guys, you can talk about, um, not having to bail immediately after sex or something like that. So laughing during sex would be a huge trigger. And then this ties in perfectly with a, a, a typical question that, um, has come up from women. It's like, yeah, my, my boyfriend or, or this guy just wasn't able to like hold me or to like once he came like he basically left the room um it was very despondent very distant or if i did laugh during sex he would get angry you know that shame would trigger like an anger response and then it would be over you know um like and it seemed like more aggressive than it even needed to be but but my hot take is if I feel like I let down a partner, if, if I don't feel like they orgasmed once, twice, multiple times, which isn't guaranteed in the, in, in the sexual experience that the female is going to orgasm, I would feel shame. And because I would feel shame, basically my orgasm, the sound of my orgasm was, I'm sorry, which is not a pleasant sound. It's not, it's not, is that enjoyment? Is that an indicator of enjoyment? I'm sorry. Here, I'm sorry. Shit. Or fuck. How many times have guys apologized after sex? Um, because of that performance based line of thinking where they're not doing it if they didn't accomplish a certain goal. So when I've thrown my seed out and I didn't feel like I pleased uh, my partner. There was no signs of orgasm, um, which used to be my direct indicator of, of sexual experience. Now it's more enjoyment. If there's, you know, how it feels to me, checking in, how does it feel with them? Um, if I did feel like I let them down, the ability for me to then go to like get out of my shame spiral and like go in for a cuddle even though I was feeling terrible about myself, it just wasn't as available. It's just not as available. And if, if you can't get out of that shame spiral, it's, it's not going to be warm and fuzzy. In fact, it might take a woman who is kind, caring, empathetic, and, and superior in the ways of like, they have mental stability in that given moment to reassure the guy to bring him back maybe whatever the guy responds to it could be lighthearted humor it could be a stern look in the face like you are enough this is fine come here and lay like telling them what to do come here lay with me hold me you bitch ass pussy whatever it is whatever the guy responds to it could take a little reassurance if you if you're a woman who doesn't feel like they're being held and you after sex and after sex means post ejaculation there might be some shame in that in that man for feeling like he didn't perform well enough that you'll have to overcome or reassure or even forgive even if you know if if you were truly disappointed by the sexual experience then that's probably felt 
So you'll need to forgive him and yourself um, to also have your cake and eat too, to have that cuddle or that, that embrace. Now, what I can recommend for guys, again, is if you can hold on to your, your ejaculation, if the end of sex doesn't mean ejaculation 100% of the time, maybe the end of sex is just um, you stop. Like it just felt really good enjoyment. Whew. Take a break. What I notice if I'm retaining my semen, that ability to cuddle, that ability to hold each other, um, to contribute to the sexual experience beyond the penetrative, um, is enhanced. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to get too high and mighty on retaining your semen. I think I just think there's value in it because of how often. I cast out, um, I you know I cast out my seed for years, and I'm just seeing because it's kind of a newer experience or it's a newer learning experience. I'm just seeing all these benefits energetically, but also like with my partner, I'm I'm just able to not be upset, you know. Um, at myself for not performing well enough, not be upset at them for, um, for whatever, you know, whatever it is, whatever the projection is. So, um, so basically the, if you want your man to soften, you might need to be a little, you might need to encourage a little more discipline. If you want him to cuddle with you and to embrace you and you want the sexual experience to be beyond the penetrative, then you might need to be a little bit more rigid and disciplined as a woman to one, speak what you want, but to two, um, just encourage a little bit of more discipline without shame. So like discipline without shame um, for a man to retain his vital essence. And that's a big one, discipline without shame. So like most men are pretty sensitive about how they perform. Again, we live in a very performance-based sexual society with not because of necessarily, but with the contributing factor of pornography and seeing men and women, you know, squirt billions of times a day uh, on a screen, thinking that that means a successful uh, sexual act. So the discipline without shame, it could take many years. Like I'm retaining a little bit better than I did a year ago when I kind of started this stuff. Um, But like today, for example, I retained and my balls hurt for like an hour and a half. So I'm wondering if I did it right. I'm wondering if it was worth it. Um, Uh, And I'm sure the book, you know, there's books that have something to say, but I need to send the energy back up or it could just be because I have a bunch of physical cum in my balls and it's maybe needs to, you know, let out, Um, especially when I'm like invoking it to get out. I'm, you know, through masturbation or sex. Uh, So I haven't found a perfect balance. I am playing with this a lot. But I have noticed that an increase in energy, an increase in interest in my partner, an interest in um, other sex besides just the penetrate the, the penetration sex by being disciplined and by retaining my semen. And that was kind of two questions in one, but it, it was pretty much the same question. And uh, yeah, just... We live in a society that's that's why I'm talking about sex because there's shame that's bound to sexuality because of Christianity or whatever it could have been before. Um, But there's this shame involved. And then and I think a lot of it has to do with this performance based way of viewing the sexual experience as opposed to having a a more abstract goal of enjoyment um, and pleasure in a given moment for as long or as little as is agreed upon between participating parties. And another topic that came up, 
um, that's not related directly. Um, but there was a woman who, who I was talking to and, and she was like, yeah, uh, I'm dating around a little bit and, um, this guy's really nice. And, um, but I just don't feel like there's anything there. And I shouldn't just date someone cause they're nice. Um, but I don't want to discourage the nice behavior and I don't know why I don't, you know, like the nice guy. It's basically it's like, it's basically do nice guys finish last? Why do nice guys finish last? And, and this is something I've thought about for a long time. I've had a friend, I've felt like the nice guy finishing last. Um, I've had friends who ha- have felt like the nice guy finishing last and it's discouraged them from being nice. And the, and this is it. This is it. I know it. I've been, I know it in my heart that this is it. You can't sacrifice authenticity for the veneer or facade for being nice. If the niceness isn't authentic, if you don't feel kind in that particular moment authentically and you're putting on the veneer, it's going to act as a repellent. Anything that's not authentic will act as a repellent. And it's, it's more likely than not, you don't feel nice all the time. Maybe there are some really nice people and, and they just genuinely carry around kindness and effortlessness all the time. And I think those people tend to attract and don't tend to say things like nice guys finish last because they're experiencing an authenticity that's allowing them to attract. We all come with what Alan Watts uh, taught me uh, with a bit of hinkagadaiken, a part of rascality, um, a little bit of mud in our eye. We all have a shadow side. And those who hide their shadow behind a veneer of kindness will repel people away. Those who are able to be vulnerable by exposing their shadow with no guarantee that they won't how other people will feel about them actually have a more likely chance to attract people into their life. You may think you're being nice by not letting your anger show. You may think you're being nice by not saying what's on your mind and smiling and nodding, but that is felt and that is repellent. It's not enough to be nice or whatever you think nice is, it is more important to be authentic, particularly when you're trying to attract a valuable relationship into your life, a sexual relationship or a partnership with someone. Nice isn't enough. Authentic will win every time. Now, if your authentic is murderous rage, maybe you've been you know, hiding your shadow for too long and it it needs to explode. And I wouldn't recommend you do that without you You need to work on that yourself before you bring that to any sort of relationship. Of course, you need to come correct in a relationship. The more you're able to come into a relationship with sovereignty and health and mental health, um, the the less expectations you'll put on a person and therefore uh, the more room the relationship actually has to grow. So you have to come in with sovereignty, but as soon as you come in with a, you know, a baseline of mental health and awareness of yourself, the more you can be authentic. Um, and look, if you're going to burst and get angry, people might leave, people might need to put up a boundary and then that might give you the clue that, okay, my authenticity is exposing itself as anger. Is there another way I can express my authenticity? Maybe at first it has to be anger, and I've certainly had stages of anger, um, and it felt very authentic, but over time I learned that I could actually redirect that in a different way, and I've become a little more stable in my emotional like interactions with people that are closest to me. 
So authenticity is going to win every time. If you're afraid to show your shadow, if you're constantly hiding your shadow and putting up the veneer, that will act as a repellent. And then, and then you'll feel like a victim. Oh man, why do nice guys always finish last? Because it's not nice to be fake as fuck. It's not nice to be inauthentic. It's not nice to yourself. So why could it ever be nice to someone else? You can hold your tongue sometimes. Look, th look, there's no particular action. There's no, because every circumstance is going to be different and every, every circumstance is going to require a unique action onto you. But the core of it has to be authenticity. And anything that's not is going to push away. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of beating a dead horse, but I'm tired of hearing nice guys finish last from people who I know are, are harboring resentment and anger and just not showing it. Not being clear, not rising to meet their challenges or looking there or confronting their demons. If you don't confront your demons, your demons are going to run you. That power to confront, like, a demon that you can overcome, you absorb its power. So by confronting your demons, by being authentic, by maybe being angry, you know, being angry if angry is called for, that could actually empower you in the right situation. Like, don't throw away any part of the human experience, any emotion, any way of handling a situation. Don't throw, like, it's so ridiculous how we judge people and we say, well, he shouldn't have handled it. Maybe that was exactly how he should have handled it. Like, maybe a fight between men or people was how they should handle it. Because maybe the resentment of not, that, of not having that physical alter, altercation was going to be more degradating over time than the actual uh, climax or the, or the crescendo or the burst. Like, to me, physical, physicality, violence, never the answer. Any, like, incorrect. Maybe sometimes it's the answer. I mean, in the court of law, self-defense, of course, is, is the answer. But, like, and that's proven. So that's just one example of how violence is sometimes the answer in, in, this, in the case of defending yourself. Authenticity is going to win. A quote, a quote's coming to mind, and it's not directly on the topic, but um, yeah, it's not on the topic at all. All it has to do with is is the word demons, and I love this quote. It's when you're celebrating your victory, your demons are in the parking lot doing push-ups. I think I said this in a podcast. Now I'm starting to get to po the point where I'm repeating myself in podcasts because I'm doing them enough where. Um, some things are cycling back, but it's mostly fresh. I just love the shit out of that quote. It, it really it helps me keep keep me uh, centered. So don't just don't confuse nice guys. Be nice. Like the the problem with conf that confusion that nice guys finish last is. Like men will resort to just these bullshit tactics of like negging and uh, and being like intentionally rude. And even if that does work, even if that that's a manipulation tactic that I guess does work, the type of person you're attracting through negging is someone who's insecure, who's someone who's and not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I've been insecure in my past and I've needed people to reach out to me, but that relationship's not going to nourish you. You need, you want sovereignty in yourself and then you want to meet someone who also has sovereignty in themselves so you can come together and create something special and kind of spiral up together. The type of person that you'll attract by negging will not satisfy in the long run. Um, or the type of person that you're attracting th through negging, you guys will have to work together 
to build self-esteem within the relationship so your relationship can persevere through time. And negging is a consequence of this false idea that nice guys finish last. Inauthentic people can't develop uh, meaningful uh, relationships. Impactful, long-term, vulnerable, sometimes uncomfortable relationships. Man, this this is like energizing the shit out of me because it's just so, it feels, I've just heard it a lot recently. I used to feel it a lot and yeah, it, there's just another way. This is kind of a short, I feel like this is a good stopping point, but it's kind of a shorter episode, um, but I think it's a good one because it's rich. Where it lacks uh, length, it's rich in um, in lessons. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I started a Patreon. Um, look, I I want to be able to sustain myself uh, by sharing content and sharing these ideas. Continue to educate myself, and and then sharing that education with others. Um, I don't know the money model that's going to end up being the one that's working um, to sustain myself and for this podcast to sustain itself. Um, But right now I'm going with Patreon where you can, I think you can support with any amount, um, maybe $3 plus, you know, like I've spent years uh, and tons of trial and error, like I said, uh, to hopefully bring a decent message, a good message to, uh, to share with, like in my mind, the target audience is me when I was 17, 18, 19, 20. So like bringing, like, uh, helping young men, uh, gain self-esteem, which is going to improve the relationships with women. It's going to pr- uh, improve how women feel about, uh, the men in their life. And then we're all going to kind of rise together. And as a man, it just feels, and as an identifying man, it just feels right to talk to men as much as they'll want to listen, um, as much as they get value. But so support is very appreciated. I I do want this to be a sustainable podcast. Um, and yes, please consider subscribing or, or contributing to my Patreon. Um Oh, and furthermore, I'm going to be including really cool, creative uh, uh, content. So one of the things I'll be doing is uh, the series, the popular series on TikTok, Things I Wish I Knew Before 30. I'm organizing them all, 1 through 22 right now. Um, I'm organizing them all into a specific place. That's what people are asking for. They're like, I I just want to watch those one after the other. Uh, I like that series. So I'm going to organize them all on Patreon. So you have one place to, to, to watch them. If you like that, please consider contributing. Like it's time that I like spending, but it would mean, it would mean a lot if, uh, you know, you can support me for that time. Uh, so yes, check out the Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Goodwin podcast or Nico. I'll put the link below and that's it yeah and subscribe if you if you want to be up to date with the uh most recent episodes thank you so much for tuning in uh love you very much this has been the good wind Whew.